Good afternoon and welcome to the Alabama Public Health Training Network. Thank you for joining us today for our program, Congenital Heart Defects, an overview of the most common birth defects. My name is Rachel Montgomery and I'm the nurse manager with the Alabama Newborn Screening Follow-Up Division at the Bureau of Clinical Laboratories. Today's program is produced and provided by the Alabama Department of Public Health Health Media and Communications Division. The expected learning objectives of the program are to describe birth defect case classifications, to list advantages and challenges of heart defect classifications, to discuss the purpose of the pulse oximetry screening in the newborn, to describe pulse oximetry equipment recommendations, to implement pulse ox training components, to identify steps for pulse oximetry screening, and to list steps for pulse ox reporting. There is no commercial support or sponsorship for the program, and there will be no endorsement of products displayed in conjunction with the activity. If you have a question about anything being discussed today, please call or email during our broadcast. The phone number and email address are on your screen now and they will appear again later in the program. Also, the handouts, sign-in sheet, and evaluation are all available online and you will need to register for this program in order to access those materials. Continuing education credits have been approved for both nurses and social workers for today's program. In order to receive credit for this training, you must watch the entire program and then complete and return the sign-in sheet and evaluation. There will be no partial credit awarded. While content may continue to be relevant, CE credit will only be awarded for two years, expiring on January the 8th, 2026. If you are watching this program on demand and want to receive a social work CE certificate, you will need to complete the social work test and send it in, along with your sign-in sheet and evaluation. And if you are watching this program live, there is no social work test required. For social workers, if you are watching this program live, it qualifies for classroom hours. And if you're watching on demand, it is considered non-classroom hours. Distance learning conference participants who are not employees, contract employees, or retirees of the Alabama Department of Public Health will pay a fee to receive continuing education certificates for this program. And now, let's get started with our first presenter. This was previously recorded. Dr. Shane Morris is the medical director for cardiovascular genetics and fetal cardi cardiology program at Baylor College of Medicine and Texas Children's Hospital. Education. My name is Dr. Shane Morris and I'm a pediatric cardiologist. I currently serve as the medical director of cardiovascular genetics at Texas Children's Hospital and Baylor College of Medicine and the medical director of fetal cardiology here. So the objectives of this talk are first to understand how surveillance data is being harnessed for outcomes research, using talking about both the benefits and limitations of current classification systems. And we're gonna focus on using congenital heart disease as the birth defective example. We're also gonna talk about potential benefits of adding a different classification system to, uh, to surveillance data to both strengthen clinical outcomes research and strengthen genetics research. So first to discuss a little bit about congenital heart disease as a birth defect. This is the most common group of birth defects seen in eight in 1,000 live births. And it's the largest contributor to infant mortality of all birth defects. So it really is critical to understand infant mortality trends and potential interventions because this uh, is so affected by congenital heart disease. So if you look at this data, this is from the CDC looking at how each of the birth defects or major aneuploidy contributes, you can see that that blue, the light blue pie is congenital heart defects and makes up uh, the largest proportion. So a little more about congenital heart disease. 
even though it's the most common type of birth defects, it's very heterogeneous, has many different etiologies. And it's best to really study individual lesions. Like you guys have heard of lesions like hypoplastic left heart syndrome or tetralogy of Fallot. Those two lesions are very, very, very different, have very, very, very different etiology, very different genetic associations, and very different. So rather than study congenital heart disease in bulk, a lot of times it's a lot more informative to look at different lesions. And in fact, most programs like the National Birth Effects Prevention Network track uh, CHD by lesion. So, and each lesion on its own is rare. For example, hypoplastic left heart syndrome is about one in 5,000 live births, even though congenital heart disease as a group is common. So um, for prevalence data, groups like the NBPD, uh, NBPDPN are excellent for prevalence data if you just want to say what percent of live births have this defect. So um, this is an article looking at prevalence of critical congenital heart disease that was recently published from the Birth Effects Prevention Network that's beautifully written and has really accurate data on prevalence. Um, now, what's being what's happening is um, these prevalence, then this is looking di by different lesions uh, and different surveillance programs, and we look and we can see, okay, looking at the different programs, active case finding versus passive case finding, we get these beautiful plots for prevalence data. But then the question comes up at outcome data, like mortality data, utilization data, how do we harness this? But you can see these prevalence data estimates are really nice. So how can we have all these patients classified in terms of lesions? And what if we want to look at outcome data? Are outcomes improving? Is mortality improving? Is care improving? Can we harness these data? So many registries track or can be linked with outcome data. So they might track hospital mortality or infant mortality or surgical outcomes or ICU hospitalizations. These are all outcome measures that those of us that are outcomes researchers like myself track. So this is an example. This is a paper that I did with an, a Texas birth defects registry several years ago where we looked at um, patients with hypo, live borns with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, and we looked at whether the distance they were delivered from a major heart hospital uh, com contributed to their mortality. So we looked at different birth eras, and we looked at postnatal versus prenatal diagnosis, and we looked at mortality. And so we harnessed the birth defects registry data to look at outcome data, and this is really exciting. And this paper was published in Circulation, which is one of the top cardiac journals in the United States. And this is another um, project, the CH Strong project, which is tracking outcome data as well. This is survival probability by age, looking by lesion. You can see that these are each different congenital heart lesions that are being tracked within the CH Strong study. And this is a beautiful paper just recently published. The limitations of using these data for outcome studies are these. So first of all, we can only use a few lesions. So even though there's about 130 uh, BP, BPN codes or ICD codes, um, they, they don't really align that well with real congenital heart lesions. So we kind of have to limit any of these outcome studies to the lesions that are confined. So like atrioventricular canal defect, this is the most common birth defect seen in uh, trisomy 21. That's a pretty clean code. It's not going to get confused with other codes. It doesn't overlap with a lot of other codes. So we can look at that. Same with hypoplastic left heart syndrome. But a lot of codes um, overlap with a lot of different lesions, and therefore people can't really use them for outcome studies. These are the lesions that are most commonly studied, and these are the lesions in that paper I just showed you, the SDH Strong study. So basically, um, the way that it works currently it, coding works is this way. So you can choose to do it a few ways. You can say any HLHS. So we're going to focus on the lesion hypoplastic left heart syndrome. So if you say any HLHS, we'll say if there's a code for HLHS, then that patient has HLHS. And HLHS is a severe lesion that has high mortality. Um, however, HLHS often coexist with other CHD that increases mortality. So if you have HLHS, they might have a total anomalous pulmonary venous return with it, which increases the mortality. So how do we better examine that? Um, so should we, should we instead use isolated HLHS um, to get sort of the normal risk lesions and then add HLHS with another major CHD? Does that 
add to the complexity. So you can see there's some there's some nuance here of how we actually code these. So we're going to talk, I'm going to give you some examples of using coding versus this versus adding different classifications. So we're going to focus on hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Just to remind people, if people aren't familiar with this lesion, this is a lesion in which the mitral valve, which is the valve that connects the left atrium to the left ventricle, and the aortic valve do not form properly, and so the left ventricle does not form properly. So there's a small or absent mitral valve, a small or absent left ventricle, a small or absent aortic valve, and so the, this basically means that the whole left heart is not functional, and the heart has to function off the right side of the heart. There's often a severe coarctation of the aorta along with this. And it's, um, you have to undergo single ventricle palliation, and it's higher, highly lethal. So here's the definition, mitral stenosis or atresia with aortic stenosis or atresia and a hypoplastic left ventricle. I will say for a child to survive birth with this, they must have a patent ductus arteriosus, and they must have an atrial septal defect to allow blood flow to both escape the left side, the atrial septal defect, and the PDA is how blood gets to the brain and to the body. So um, if we look, I used, I didn't have access to the Texas Birth Defects Registry for these data, so this is just an example. Instead, I pulled this from the Texas Public Use Data File, which is a um, statewide publicly available database using ICD-9 and ICD-10 codes, and we have those data from 1999 to 2020. So if we just said any HLHS, anyone who carries um, a definite a, a, a diagnosis of HLHS counts, there were 6,106 uh, newborn hospitalizations with these were limitings to newborn hospitalizations. Now, what if we look at coexisting major defects? So uh, 154 of those patients had aortic stenosis also coded, which is common because they all have an aortic valve problem. 1,103 had coarctation coded. And 1789 had an ASD coded. Remember, ASD is a mandatory part of this. But how do you, when you're coding, decide how to use these? So if we, if we subtracted, if we said isolated HLHS, we're going to lose all these patients. If we said, oh, we're going to subtract any other major code, we're going to lose these patients. Um, also, several of them had lesions that add to the mortality. So if we look at total anomalous pulmonary venous return, which makes HLHS much more highly lethal, there's 135. If we had pulmonary valve stenosis, a right-sided lesion that adds to mortality, that's an extra 85. And if we had core triatriatum, this is a rare disease of the left atrium, um, which also adds uh, mortality, we have 35. So how do we deal with those? So, and then we also have some patients where there must be miscoding. So um, truncus arteriosus and hypoplastic left heart syndrome cannot exist together. Those are two totally different diseases that do not exist together. You can have a small left ventricle and truncus arteriosus, but that's not the same as hypoplastic left heart syndrome. So there were 21 patients that had both of those codes, and those should just not be included in any analysis because we don't know which one was miscoded. Additionally, transposition of the great arteries and hypoplastic left heart syndrome cannot occur together. Uh, hypoplastic left heart syndrome, by definition, has no, the great arteries that are in the, the normal location. So that's another 170 patients who really shouldn't be included because that coding doesn't make sense. So if we use the traditional method of coding and we said all anyone who has HLHS, that's the 6,094, and we looked at hospital mortality, we get a mortality of 14.5%. But again, we have some high mortality lesions. We have some incorrect people in there. If we did isolated HLHS, that means we're going to take out anyone who has another birth, major birth defect code. We're going to cut that number in half. We're only going to go down to 3,800. We're going to lose um, more than 2,000 cases of HLHS by limiting the codes. But should those really be limited? And the mortality for that is 13.5. We developed a new way of coding called risk-based coding. And what this does is it keeps codes or ignores codes that are part of the diagnosis. So for example, in this case, we would ignore mitral stenosis. We would ignore aortic stenosis. We would ignore coarctation because those are, we would ignore PDA. We ignore ASD because those are all part of HLHS. But um, we would exclude codes that increase mortality or lesions that suggest miscoding. If we apply this coding and don't get rid of the aortic stenosis, the mitral stenosis, et cetera, we cut, the number goes down to 5,400. We only lost about 500 cases instead of 
thousand cases, and you can see that our mortality estimate is very similar to the first, but it's much more accurate. We've kept these standard risk patients. Then we do a second level where we take these patients, we exclude, we don't exclude those patients that have codes that are consistent with the diagnosis, but we say if they have, oh, sorry, if they have the additional high risk code, we put them in the high risk group. And you can see that the mortality in this group goes up to 27.6, and we're up to 5,700 patients. So we've lost very few, and we've more appropriately coded them for outcomes rather than using this all coding that's kind of messy or the isolated, which is over-restricted. This is another example. We're going to look at coarctation of the aorta. This is a much more benign lesion that, um, that is just a narrowing of the uh, distal aorta here, and but is in the same family of HLHS. So this can be associated with any major congenital heart disease. So it can be added to transposition. It could be added to truncus arteriosus. It could be added to um, multiple other conditions. And, um, and so let's look at that versus HLHS. So if we used all coarctation, we're going to get 10,000 cases, and the hospital mortality is going to be less than one year. If we use isolated coarctation, sorry, give me one second. If we use isolated coarctation and take out all major heart disease, we are going to cut almost 7,000 cases and get, we do get lower mortality because all those complex lesions have been taken out by 4.7. However, if we apply our risk based coding, so codes that are part of the diagnosis, like to survive with severe coarctation, you have to have PDA, so we're going to keep PDA. We're going to keep ASD and VSD because those don't really increase mortality. We're going to get rid of transposition of the great arteries. We're going to get rid of tr truncus arteriosus, or at least put those in the higher risk category. If we use our risk-based coding, then we get to keep 7,500 cases, a much greater number, more than double this number of cases, and have a mortality that's more consistent, five. And we'll get an extra 1,500 cases that we classify as high risk. This is coarctation plus a higher risk lesion. And it goes up to 12.5%. So we'll argue that this is a much more accurate way for outcome-based coding, um, use, adding another layer of classification besides what we're already using. So sorry, you can mark, mark through those. So basically, in summary, to consider risk-based classification to improve mortality assessments. These are more aligned with the clinical conditions and what I see in practice, and they're going to make more sense to practitioners. They retain a larger portion of the cohort by keeping low-risk common coexisting lesions within the cohort and allow you to improve power. It discriminates high and low-risk groups. It can be also be used to make clustered or continuous risk scales um, because you can add low-risk, high-risk. We can even add more layers of risk. And it also allows you to evaluate a larger number of lesions. We can look at truncus with coart, truncus without coarctation. You can look at HLHS with higher in risk. So it allows you to use a larger number of your uh, cohorts that you're examining. So I look forward to any questions and thank you. Oh, sorry, one other thing I forgot to mention. So also harnessing a couple of slides, just harnessing these data for genetic studies. So um, CHD is divided into different groups or the way we define them into etiology groups. So most of them follow in these natural types. So we think we, we organize these CHD lesions in these groups because they run together in families or with the same genetic condition. So we'll see a mother and a son with these related conditions. They're not the same CHD, but we know developmentally they're the same. And um, so the old mentality, you know, ages ago was, well, if we see congenital heart disease, we want to think of 22Q11 deletion syndrome, which is also called DeGeorge syndrome. However, that's only really seen in one subgroup of congenital heart disease, that is the um, conotruncal diseases. So we're much more sophisticated now knowing about genetics. We know that up to 30% of critical congenital heart disease can be found to have a monogenic cause or a genetic cause caused by one gene or one uh, chromosomal anomaly. So this is kind of historically how CHD was clustered. Um, if we look and people said, okay, well, there's left-sided lesions, there's right-sided lesions, there's conotruncal defects, there's septal defects, there's heterotaxy, and there's other things we're not sure where to classify them. And I put what the lesions are based on these pockets. However, with more genetic research, this is sort of updated where the field is living, genetically based, and the yellow ones are where things have moved. 
we realize that bicuspid aortic valve is a really mild form of a left-sided lesion. It's moved up into left-sided lesions. We've added a slice of pie called elastin arteriopathy. Supravalvar aortic stenosis and supravalvar pulmonary stenosis are usually due to an abnormality of elastin unrelated to these other lesions, so it's kind of its own set of piece of the pie. We found that transposition of the great arteries, congenitally corrected transposition of the great arteries, um, and some of these other conditions that have malposed great arteries actually go in laterality defects where they had sat with conotruncal defects before. We had said, okay, the artery's in the wrong place, it's conotruncal, but really they go here with laterality defects because we know that genes affecting patterning cause them. And we know things like interrupted arch and double right aortic arch, which um, are now conotruncal lesions. They're caused by the same genes that cause conotruncal lesions. So we've modified genetically where things lie from an etiologic basis. So the question is, could we modify the coding grouping into these categories, these slices of the pie, rather than using the old, the old terminology, which probably doesn't align as much with etiologic basis of disease? So, for example, um, if we look at conotruncal defects, we know that almost all of them affect genes in this outflow tract, second heart field, and they're due to alterations in this, uh, in this arena, in these two fields. And the highest frequency, of course, is George syndrome, but we know we also see it in trisomy 21, trisomy 13, trisomy 18, but these, we think these conditions are affecting the second heart field, causing these lesions. We also see it with certain copy number variants, um, including copy number variants of the CHD7 gene, which causes charge syndrome, and the 8P23 gene. We also see it with single gene variants. So these are just misspellings, sorry, misspellings in the genes, um, and these are common genes that are the same genes that are seen in these copy number areas. Now, when we look at laterality, it isn't the second heart field, it isn't the neural crest. These are due to signaling errors in which way the heart is supposed to loop, which way the vessels are supposed to loop. So due to alterations in right-left directionality and ciliary. Ciliary are these little, these little hairs that tell you which way to go in development. And um, apart from heterotaxy, most of these patients are not syndromic. So a lot of conotruncal lesions have syndromic presentations. These patients look pretty normal besides their organs are in the wrong place. So totally different way of getting congenital heart disease. The highest frequency um, at these can, are almost all single gene defects, so aren't chromosomal, but instead these little spelling changes. So we see them in positioning genes, ciliary genes, and they're almost all going to be missed by standard genetic testing methods, karyotype, FISH, CMA, and they're only going to be picked up by genetic screening. So something to consider going forward is using a genetic-based classification system, and I think this will improve etiologic assessments. Even if we're looking at environmental factors, those environmental factors might affect laterality, or they might affect the second heart field, but if we have them grouped by genetic basis, we might be able to elucidate this better. So it would allow for cleaner separation of congenital heart disease, clearer elucidation of differential exposures, both genetic and environmental. Um, so basically, overall, the current classification systems are just wonderful for prevalence calculation, but have limited use for mortality calculations. Risk-based classification of CHD lesions will bet let us better assess mortality risk and keeping keep commonly associated CHD lesions together rather than just looking at everything lumped together or extreme isolation that doesn't make clinical sense. We also know that up to 30% of patients are now known to have a genetic association. And because it's such a heterogeneous collection of, of conditions, if we group by genetic etiology, we might better be able to further our science understanding the pathways. And thank you very much. That is everything. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Um, I do have a few questions um, that I wanted to ask. Um, are there certain CHDs that are more likely to be identified prenatally? Absolutely. So, um, you know, CHDs affect common the, either the core of the heart or the alpha tracts or both. And so we know that the four chamber view is something that's easily attainable. We've done for many decades in obstetrics. And so for sure, the lesions that are more easily visible on the four chamber view, like hypoplastic left heart syndrome or tricuspid atresia or ventricular septal defects, those are much more commonly picked up than the lesions that are only affect the outflow tracts. So outflow tracts would be like transposition of the great arteries um, is the most common one, and it's the least likely to be prenatally diagnosed. Also, a lesion like 
total anomalous pulmonary venous return. This is the pulmonary veins come back to the wrong chamber. It's very hard to identify. Um, those are very low likelihood. Now, in 2014, the American College of Gynecology made assessment of the outflow tracts mandatory in prenatal assessment. So people are looking longitudinally if our prenatal detection has gone up. I just was at the American Heart Association this weekend and saw some data being presented from one of the birth defects research studies. And it looks like that might be increasing, which is great. Um, but for sure, outflow tract lesions or venous anomalies are much harder to diagnose than things that are readily apparent on the four chamber view. Thank you. Um, uh, are there certain CHDs that are likely to be missed um, either prenatally or through the pulse sock screening that most states are doing now to detect them? Yeah, definitely. So like I mentioned, the ones that are outflow tract or venous are easily missed prenatally. Most lesions will be picked up on um, on uh, pulse oximetry screening. There are a few like the more moderate lesions that progress like coarctation of the aorta um, because when the arches, you won't pick it up early on pulse ox because it doesn't cause desaturations. But as the coarctation gets worse, that PDA has to, which has blue blood, has to give blood to the lower extremities. And those patients might, as it gets worse, might have a little bit of cyanosis. So they might pass the pulse ox screening early, but as the ductus arteriosus closes, they might get worse or they might get sick later. So some of those lesions can be a little harder to pick up. And same with total and almost pulmonary venous return. They're only a little desaturated, not a lot, depending on the severity. So those can be missed too. And if a, a baby fails the pulse socks, how soon should they receive an echocardiogram if that's indicated? We usually do it that during that hospitalization before they go home. So, um, you know, we do have to repeat it because false positives are common, like false failings, but they repeat it again and their saturation is fine. But we do recommend it the same day because, you know, most of these pulse ox screenings are done between the second and fourth day of life when a patient's going to be discharged. But that's the same time as when the ductus arteriosus closes, and a lot of our lesions are ductal dependent lesions. And so we definitely don't want that patient to potentially have a ductal dependent lesion where they could get quite ill um, going home. So we do it right away. Yes. And yeah, in our state in Alabama, we do have several rural hospitals. So sometimes that's an issue to um, get babies. Get, getting them a timely echocardiogram. So um, I can imagine that's hard. I know yes. in Texas, we have a lot of rural areas too. And so I think most of these hospitals have a program in place to get them assessed, but it's hard. You know, we did a study a few years ago and half of the hospitals in Texas that deliver newborns do not have prostaglandin, which is the medicine mm -hmm. that, um, that you, the way you keep the, the PDA open because it's too cost, it's too expensive. They're not delivering enough babies to warrant keeping a fresh vial, but that that is a little scary. Now, that represents a small number of babies, even though it's half of institutions, because they're mostly rural institutions, but for sure they need, you know, having uh, processes set up to get them a rapid assessment is important. Um, do you have any data on how many infant deaths are contributable, uh, contributable to uh, CHDs in the U.S.? Oh, um, oh, I need to look it up. I mean, it's the highest contributor of birth defect related mortality. Um, I don't have the number offhand, but it's, you know, it's it's quite high. Yeah. Um, and then uh, do you know of any data out there that has uh, demonstrated how COVID-19 has impacted infants in CHDs? Well, this is a huge question. There's lots of work being done. You know, a lot of the monitoring authorities are just now getting 2020 and 2021 data. So I don't I think there's, I can talk about the questions that are coming up. Um, you know, we didn't, we don't think that, co, you know, co, the main problem with COVID in children is it causes cardiac inflammation, myocarditis, and this post-inflammation thing called MISC or multisystemic inflammatory disease of childhood. That didn't seem to select children with congenital heart disease more than children without congenital heart disease. Certainly we had lots of very sick children from COVID. I mean, I remember at one point we had 250 here. Um, with COVID-associated heart inflammation, but it didn't seem to be more than with or without CHD, but people are looking at that to see if that is true. Um, another question came up, which I think could happen, is that because exposure to the medical system was trying to be limited, mothers certainly got less prenatal evaluation, especially in 2020. And were we missing 
some congenital heart disease that year because there was much more reluctance to get prenatal screening. Um, a couple of centers have looked at their own centers and don't think the numbers went down. I definitely have the gist that in Texas, our numbers that, that we missed more. I, I certainly, we certainly felt here that we were getting a lot more non prenatally diagnosed patients late in 2020 and in early in 2021, but I don't think any of the data, hard data are out there yet. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. That's all the questions I have, um, but very interesting information. Um, we are excited to uh, hopefully soon begin uh, collecting information on birth defects in Alabama. I know we're a state that has, you know, a high infant mortality rate. So, and I know, as you mentioned, heart defects are a leading cause of infant mortality. So um, we're very excited to implement this and we appreciate all of your knowledge and expertise. And uh, maybe we'll be reaching out to Texas um, to uh, uh, partner with them or um, uh, collaborate with them as we move forward. So. Uh, that would be wonderful. Yeah. Very exciting. But thank you so much. I appreciate your time. All right. Thank you for the opportunity. Bye-bye. So thank you again, Dr. Morris, for uh, sharing your expertise and knowledge on heart defects. That Again, that was a pre-recorded video. Um, so she was gracious enough to uh, record that for us since uh, she was in Texas. So we appreciate her. Uh, taking the time. So at this time, I'm going to, in recognition of January being Birth Defects Awareness Month, I'm going to talk to you about pulse oximetry screening uh, in regards to the newborn screen. Um, but first, I just want to disclaim that the Alabama Department of Public Health uh, does not endorse a particular equipment manufacturer and that the pulse oximetry hospital guidelines that I'll be discussing today uh, were developed with permission from the Children's National Medical Center in Washington, D.C. So the objectives for today's program, again, are to discuss the purpose of the pulse oximetry screening in the newborn. I'm going to do uh, go over and hopefully you'll be able to describe the pulse ox equipment standards or recommendations. Uh, you'll uh, hopefully be able to implement pulse ox training components, identify steps for pulse ox screening, and then finally list steps for pulse ox reporting. Um, but as Dr. Morris previously mentioned, she shared some information with us but I wanted to share some additional data that comes directly from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention website. So according to the CDC, CHDs are the most common types of birth defects. According um, to them, they affect uh, nearly 1% or approximately 40,000 births each year in the United States. The most common type of heart defect is ventricular septal defect. And then one in four babies with a congenital heart defect have a critical heart defect. And according to the CDC, the prevalence of some congenital heart defects, um, especially the milder types, they are increasing while the prevalence of other types has remained stable. They also report that the prevalence of all types of CHDs, including critical CHDs, it can vary by state and by type of defect. And CHDs are the leading cause of birth defect associated infant illness and death in the United States. And in a study of neonatal deaths, 4.2% of all neonatal deaths were due to a CHD. And so, again, the Alabama Department of Public Health created hospital guidelines for implementing pulse oximetry screening for critical heart defects. And in 2012, uh, pulse ox screening was implemented in Alabama as part of routine newborn screening care. And these guidelines, they can be found on the newborn screening website. 
at www.alabamapublichealth.gov slash newborn screening. In 2011, the Alabama Department of Public Health gathered a work group of various organizations across the state. And individuals from these various organizations contributed to the developing the screening algorithm. And this slide here just shows that it acknowledges those individuals that who participated and contributed to developing screening criteria for Alabama birthing hospitals. And so you can see here that the Alabama chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics was involved, as well as the Alabama Hospital Association, the Alabama Medicaid Agency, um, the American Heart Association, and we had several hospitals throughout the state who participated, as well as the March of Dimes, and uh, several neonatologists and pediatric cardiologists that were also involved in helping create those screening uh, criteria. And so the purpose of the pulse ox screen is uh, it's used to detect the critical congenital heart disease, or CCHD, in infants before they leave the hospital or prior to that ductus arteriosus closure, as Dr. Morris mentioned, which typically happens two to three days after birth. And that's when the heart uh, defect complications can develop, when that um, PDA closes. And so it's also important to note that pulse heart screening does not replace a complete history and physical examination. So some possible physical symptoms of the critical congenital heart disease uh, or defects include uh, problems breathing. It could include a heart murmur or pounding heart in the newborn, a weak pulse. They can have very pale or blue skin color. Uh, they can be poor feeders um, and very sleepy. So these are some of the signs, possible physical symptoms that might appear uh, if a baby had a critical heart defect. And so again, the screening, the purpose of the screening is to target those uh, seven specific anomalies classified as critical heart defects. Um, and they're listed here. And they include hypoplastic left heart syndrome, pulmonary atresia with intact septum, tetralogy of flow, total anomalous pulmonary venous return, transposition of the great arteries, tricuspid atresia, and then truncus arteriosus. Um, and again, there are other secondary targets or defects that may also be identified through the pulse sock screen, uh, but the screen itself is intended to uh, identify these seven critical defects. So it is recommended that each birthing hospital select a pulse oximeter for screening the newborns. And again, we don't endorse any specific equipment, but uh, equipment does have to meet certain standards, national standards, and adhere to uh, the following. Uh, the equipment should be motion tolerant and report functional oxygen saturation. Uh, the equipment should be validated in low perfusion conditions. It should be cleared by the FDA for use in newborns. And it needs to be calibrated regularly per manufacturer guidelines. And so birthing hospitals are responsible for training uh, staff to perform the pulse oximetry screening per the recommended algorithm. Um, and it's helpful to implement hands-on competency-based training, which I'm going to review a few of uh, the components for the training. So training should include an overview of the screening protocol, which I will review in a, in a few moments here. It should also include education on the use of the equipment. 
uh, differences between adult and pediatric oximeter probes, the importance of adequate circulation, effects of hyperthermia and phototherapy on the newborn, and then uh, finally, facility resources or procedures for timely pediatric echocardiogram. So there are some training tools included in the hospital guidelines, um, and it, it includes a, a knowledge assessment quiz and a competency checklist. So it is important to select probe placement on both the right hand and either foot. And the right hand is used to detect preductal blood shunting across the patent ductus arteriosus, which is, again, it's common in many types of these critical heart defects. So the left hand, it's, it's often been ignored because it was unclear if the ductus arteriosus influences left hand arterial perfusion. So the right hand has been found to be the most accurate value that reflects arterial oxygen saturation. Um, it's also uh, important that the photo detect a portion of the probe be placed on the fleshy side of the infant skin uh, of the right hand and either foot. And the light emitter should be placed on top of the right hand and foot. So it is important for the photo detector and emit emitter, the light emitter, to be opposite each other in order to obtain an accurate reading. And the probe should be secured using the recommended adhesive provided by the manufacturer. So th this is an image of proper placement of that uh, pulse ox probe, and you can see the light emitter on the top of the right hand and infant foot. Um, and you can see um, uh, the wire that's placed on the uh, bottom side of the, the hand and the foot. It is important to use a new clean probe for each infant if, uh, if you're using a disposable probe. And if you're using a reusable probe, you should clean it per the manufacturer's recommended recommendations for use of disinfectant solution. You also want to be sure to use an infant probe. Um, there are adult probes and infant probes, um, so you want to make sure that uh, an infant probe is used when screening the newborn. And in addition, there shouldn't be any gaps between the sensor and the infant skin. So again, just make sure it's secured um, uh, with the adhesive properly on, on the hand and the foot. So be sure the newborn is calm and warm during the pulse ox screening. It is helpful sometimes to swaddle the infant and encourage the family to be involved to help promote comfort because you don't want the baby crying or moving uh, when you try to obtain the pulse sock screening. And it's an automatic blood pressure cuff should not be used when obtaining a pulse sock screening because that could also impact uh, picking up that oxygen saturation. So uh, again, ensure that the infant is not placed in bright light while pulse socks is being performed. And it's not recommended to use tape, again, to apply the pulse ox probe to the infant skin. You want to use the adhesive um, that's provided. And it's also important to be aware that the pulse ox readings are not instantaneous. It does take several seconds to pick up that oxygen saturation. So this slide here, um, this shows the pulse ox screening algorithm. Again, that was developed uh, by um, several organizations. They actually, we adopted it again from the Children's National Medical Center who initially came up with this algorithm. And then our uh, uh, individuals in our state, they did edit it and change it up a little bit. 
Um, so this should be performed on all well babies. This isn't intended uh, to be used for infants that are on continuous oxygen in the NICU. Um, it, is, um, it should be done between 24 and 48 hours of age. And you can see here in this light blue box uh, what an immediate fail represents. So a pulse ox reading that's less than 90% in the right hand or foot at any time is an immediate fail. And so the screener should notify the physician of an immediate fail and they should perform an evaluation for causes. If there is no cause found, then an echocardiogram may be indicated and they need to uh, make sure that that is uh, completed prior to the baby going home. It is recommended that echocardiogram be interpreted by a pediatric cardiologist if possible. And again, this may require transfer to a NICU with pediatric cardiology services. And so in the middle here, you'll see the purple box. This is a failed uh, result, which is a pulse ox reading of 90% to 94% in the right hand and foot, or a difference of four or more between the right hand and foot readings. So if a baby fails with uh, the criteria mentioned, then the pulse heart screening should be repeated in one hour. And if the baby fails again, it should be repeated in another hour. And then if the baby fails uh, that uh, final repeat screen, then the physician should be notified and an immediate evaluation performed to determine cause. And again, if there's no etiology found, then the physician should be consulted um, and a pediatric cardiology uh, may be uh, consulted for a diagnostic echocardiogram. Physician to physician communication is recommended for any failed pulse socks results. And then finally, you can see here in the pink box, uh, a past result is a reading of 95% or higher in the right hand and foot and a difference of three or less between the right hand and foot readings. So state law uh, requires hospitals to report failed results to the Alabama Department of Public Health as soon as a screening is completed or shortly thereafter. And uh, currently there is a reporting form that is available on the newborn screening website for reporting the failed results to the state. And this reporting form should be completed and submitted to the fax number that's sh um, shown on this form at 334-206-3791. It's important to completely fill out the form with all information, including etiology if known, and if the baby's transported to another hospital we, our staff will, uh, as soon as we get these forms, we do follow up uh, to confirm if the baby's had an echocardiogram or not and uh, to determine if there's another cause uh, for the failed results. So we do follow up and, and we do track these babies. We do have, we have recently implemented a new web-based system that will allow electronic upload of failed pulse ox results. And, and we are in the process of working with hospitals to train them and onboard them. So, um, so hopefully we'll have the ability to report electronically through our new web-based system. So it is important uh, to provide parent education prior to screening as well. Um, you just want to let the parents know, they should be informed that the screening is not painful, that it only takes a few minutes to perform. And again, just um, emphasize that the, that the screening is used to target critical heart issues, but that a baby could, you know, may have another heart issue that may not be picked up by the screening. 
And so now I'm just going to go through some uh, to kind of summarize what's been discussed and to test your knowledge. Um, go through uh, the knowledge assessment. Again, this is a tool that is provided in the hospital guidelines. So all of this information is included in that. Um, but we'll go through a few of these. So it states here, the following can affect the accuracy of the pulse oximetry reading. Um, a, movement. B, cold extremities or shivering. C, crying. D, bilirubin lamps and surgical lights, or E, all of the above. So what, what do you think can affect the accuracy of the pulse ox reading? Um, the answer to this one is E, all of the above. So all of these uh, can affect the pulse ox reading, so it's important uh, that, again, it, that's why it's important to make sure the newborn is calm um, and comfortable when performing the pulse sock screening. So one clean disposable pulse socks probe can be used on up to five patients, true or false? And again, uh, the answer to that would be false. Uh, if you're using a disposable probe, you want to make sure to discard it with each use. I can't, again, if you're using reusable probes, then you can disinfect those and reuse those. And then all of the following can affect the accuracy of the pulse ox reading except A, placing the probe on the same extremity you are taking the blood pressure. B, performing while the infant is crying. C, using a clip on the finger of an infant. Or D, infant skin color or jaundice. So the answer to, to this would be um, D, infant skin color or jaundice. Uh, that would be the only thing that would not affect the accuracy of the pulse ox reading. And then this states, pulse ox screening will detect all forms of congenital heart defects. Again, um, as previously stated, that is false. Uh, the pulse ox screening, again, the purpose of it is intended to detect the critical heart defects. Um, although, again, secondary defects might be picked up through pulse ox, um, it will not pick up all forms of heart defects. Um, the screening guidelines state that pulse ox screening should be performed on A, the right hand, B, one foot, C, both A and B, or D, neither A or B. Um, and uh, that is C, both A and B. So again, it's important to do the pre and postductal screening which is the right hand and either foot, at least one foot, and that should be done simultaneously or in direct sequence. And so this states, pulse ox screening should be performed when the infant is what age? A, less than eight hours. B, between eight hours and 18 hours. C, greater than 24 hours, or D, less than 24 hours? And the answer to that is C, greater than 24 hours. Again, the pulse ox screening should be performed between 24 and 48 hours of age. So if an infant fails the pulse ox screening, hospital staff should immediately a, perform clinical evaluation. B, immediate echocardiogram, which may require transfer to a NICU with cardiology services. C, referral for an outpatient echocardiogram. Or D, both A and B. And the answer to this is uh, both A and B. Um, of course, again, you want to perform that clinical evaluation. 
and if indicated, if there's no other etiology, then an immediate echocardiogram should be um, performed, and that may require transfer again to a hospital with uh, NICU with cardiology services. And so I'm just going to go through a few uh, frequently asked questions. Again, some of these questions are included in those hospital guidelines. Um, these are questions that maybe you might get from parents. Um, so this is just a helpful tool um, that will provide some of that information. So again, what is pulse oximetry? It's just a simple test to me measure oxygen. How is pulse ox performed? Again, there's a sticky strip with a small red light and it's placed on the hand and foot. And it will automatically pick up that oxygen saturation. So why is pulse oximetry used? It is used uh, as an easy method to determine if an infant's heart and lungs are healthy. And then again, when will it be performed or when should it be, it be performed? And, uh, again, it's recommended that it be performed after the baby is 24 hours old. And so a normal reading, again, is a oxygen saturation of 95% or higher and a difference of three or less between the right hand and foot. So that concludes uh, my presentation today on pulse oximetry in the newborn. So I will see if there are any questions, if we have any email questions. Um, again, if you have questions, uh, now's a good time to email them to the email address on your screen. So if you do have any questions, please submit those. Um, and you can email them to the email address um, at any time. And I don't think we have any email questions at this time. No, um, I did try to go through as many questions as possible um, that might be asked. So uh, again, in recognition of January being birth defect uh, prevention or birth defects awareness month, uh, we appreciate your time and attention and just help promote uh, pulse ox screening for critical congenital heart defects. So this concludes our program for today. Uh, again, I want to thank Dr. Morris for her presentation, and I want to thank you for joining this afternoon and watching. Um, and please remember that you can refer back to the training and resources anytime on demand. Um, it will be linked again to the Alabama Public Health Training Network. So we thank you for joining and hope you have a great day.